everyone and welcome um, again uh, for the uh, Regional Innovation Forum for the Americas, uh, which is taking place alongside with the Global Innovation Forum uh, just right this week. Um, and now we are in our second session for the Americas uh, Regional Forum. Uh, which is about the innovation journey. And we are going to hear today amazing stories uh, from uh, the front lines, um, innovators, entrepreneurs uh, in the Americas who are doing uh, amazing work on the ground, uh, bringing education, um, allowing people with disabilities to get uh, uh, access uh, to a full life and, and also uh, those that are supporting other innovators and startups to uh, get their way in. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for everyone um, uh, for joining. Um, I hope I, I didn't introduce myself to start with. I'm uh, Raquel Gato. I'm Brazilian. I'm speaking in English right now just to avoid it with my Portugal. Um, but uh, we do have interpretation. So um, if anyone needs um, uh, the, the translation, the interpretation, um, just go um, and, 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 and the options in the menu bar uh, below. Uh, and you can see there is English and Spanish available. Um, so I'm going to be the moderator for today. Um, we do have a 80 minute session. Uh, so uh, hopefully we can go for some uh, short pitch rounds uh, to understand more about each of the uh, winners and mentors uh, to, to all the innovators um, represented here uh, about their challenges and uh, what we can do to replicate and to get better um, as a region um, and as uh, collaborating uh, with the digital ecosystem. So uh, without further friend there, I do because uh, it, the important thing is to hear from, uh, from our panelists. Um, I'm going to quickly introduce, uh, we do have five panelists here today. Uh, first, uh, Valentina Araya. Uh, Valentina, I, I'm sorry, I'm Hello. sharing the screen so I cannot see you. Valentina is the key account manager for Startup Chile. She's also the 2019 uh, winner for the IT Challenge Award. And uh, this year, she's also a mentor uh, for, for, for the new group. Um, she's also based, well, in Chile, right? <laughs> so uh, welcome, Valentina. We also have Sean Melville. Uh, Sean, are you there? I, I'm not able to see you, but um, OK. Sean is not here yet, so we are going to, um, to save his seat. Uh, but uh, Sean is the managing director from Ibsen uh, Technologies. He is also a, a 2019 uh, winner uh, and a, uh, a, a 2020 mentor. And he is from uh, Trinidad and Tobago uh, from, from the Caribbean. Um, next, we have Carlos Mosquera. Carlos is uh, the creator of Guiding Sounds. He's also um, uh, a Venezuelan uh, who is now living in, in, in the US and we're going to hear more about uh, Carlos 2020 uh, winner uh, context uh, uh, going on. Um, and then next we have uh, Zainab Khan and I, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Please just let me know if I'm not, uh, correct me. Uh, but uh, Zainab is um, the creator of the uh, Tick Mill, uh, teach a kid, make an individual life. Uh, and uh, Zeneb is based in Canada. And then we have uh, finally, but not uh, least, uh, least but not less, but not least, uh, Nelson Mila uh, from Honduras. Uh, Nelson is uh, the, uh, the founder of Macau Tech. Uh, which is also dealing with uh, educational skills, and he is going to take uh, us through his journey pretty soon. So um, I hope everyone. Uh, oh, now I can see Sean is also here. Sean, welcome. Um, if you need, so let me just make sure again um, that everyone is aware that we do have the interpretation. Um, if you need uh, interpretation into Spanish or English, you can uh, enable in the menu just below in the Zoom. Um, 
and uh, and uh, it should be working. If not, just let us know. Um, I also had uh, the information from one organizers um, a while back that we had about uh, 200 people uh, in swap card today. Uh, we don't have the, the figures right now for, for this session, uh, but just so that you know that there is um, uh, there are people uh, joining and, and uh, it's amazing to, to have this crowd and, and this discussion. So let's go um, with time, time is ticking. Um, um, for the first round of question, and I'm going to start with Valentina. Um, so my first question to you guys who, has, who have been working on the ground um, is how do you feel um, uh, like being an innovator in, in our ecosystem, in, in, in our region? How does it feel like? And if you can take us through the pitch in three minutes. Valentina? All right. So on, on the side of, of, of the institution I work in that Startup Chile, it has been challenging since the beginning because we started as an experiment. So we had to first validate that we were, were doing actually added value. And then we had to, to keep finding new ways of, of adding value to the country, to the entrepreneurs, and somehow remain competitive because uh, we were the first public accelerator, but then the whole offer of, of the LATAM system started to grow. So we have to find new ways and we have to be reinventing ourselves all the time. So it's, it's amazing to be like the, the, the head of, of this kind of ecosystem, but also it's very challenging in terms that you have to be always finding new ways of became, um, to keep somehow outdated and, and always be doing something valuable for, for those that you're trying to support. And on the other side, on the side of the entrepreneurs, I have talked to some of them and they say it's also challenging because we are still a young ecosystem. So the perception that we have in terms of what is a successful business is quite different from maybe the perception that you can find in the US or in the Israel ecosystem. So we still maybe believe that achieving and receiving a lot of prizes and rewards means that you are going in the right direction, but if you are still failing in to make your project and your idea into a enterprise that uh, actually have traction and it's in a new market, um, maybe you are not in, in that right path. So it, that kind of perception sometimes uh, makes entrepreneurs confused and makes make people think that this is a, maybe an easy journey and it's a very direct journey, but it's not you're probably going to fail a few times before you actually succeed. And that's a very good lesson, uh, Valentino. Thanks very much. Uh, we need to be comfortable to fail and to um, start again and, and, and try new things and, 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 uh, and uh, sometimes persist, right? Um, tenacity is, is a key word. <laughs> so um, next, uh, I'm also going to ask Sean, um, if you can walk us through, um, how did you feel being an innovator uh, in, in, in our region and uh, in the Caribbean? Can you okay. share? Yeah. Hi, Raquel. Thank you. So I would just share, I guess, in terms of my journey, because my journey has been one that has been unconventional in the sense that I started uh, this not intentionally speaking at a startup weekend event. And coming out of that, I actually met one of my co-founders who's totally blind. And we actually just innovated and came up with a solution, but there was no real intention to start a business. But in the process of going through that journey, we, saw, we got the opportunity because we won an award and we, you know, we were able to see the potential it had. We started off and register the company. And therein lies a challenge in that if you are not fully aware of all of the things that you need to, to do in order to run a business, it therefore becomes a difficult journey because you're not, you may not necessarily get into a business understanding the difficulties that you may go through and have a clear um, go-to-market strategy. Uh, but what I would say has worked for me is that I surrounded myself with um, mentors and other persons who can provide some of that insight. And I, I would have 
um, made it a little bit easier for me in that I actually gathered information from various sources. And I would say we have a lot of information, but it's not very organized. And so the challenge is you have all these different groups, um, startup communities, um, government agencies, they all are there to support these initiatives, but there's no coordination of the ecosystem. And so I had to find myself going from one silo to the next, really to understand what are the different roles each player has to contribute to making this ecosystem work. And so having gone through that process of not knowing, learning as I go along and really experimenting with the viability of my idea, that has now made it a little bit more viable for me to be able to offer solutions. So it was a bit of experimentation, exploration, and seeing how, what works and what doesn't. That's what worked. And I think if more people approach it that way, it may be more helpful for them to understand how to build a business. Perfect, Sean, and it's a perfect hook uh, after Valentina, right? It's having the safe environment to, to fail, but also uh, how important it is to get information about what to expect, where to start, and uh, just experiment. So very good uh, points. And we do have next uh, also Carlos, who is uh, working with uh, also with innovation uh, for um, uh, accessibility for people with disabilities. Um, so Carlos, do you want also to tell us about the, uh, your journey and uh, how did you feel being an innovator um, in, in, in our region? And I guess you have the experience from um, uh, kind of two uh, worlds from Venezuela and from USA. Well, actually, I totally understand and relate to Sean's story. Um, in my case, um, more in the technical side, my business background is really weak. Um, but my project personally is more about uh, trying to get support from the public sector. And even though I, I'm based in LA, and even though LA is amazing, to be honest, in, in terms of support, uh, in terms of diversity, education, connectivity, you know, it's very pragmatic and the standard of living is actually very accessible. I mean, compared to, you know, Silicon Valley. Uh, either way, um, to me, it's been more difficult to access that public sector. Like I need help from, from, the, I don't know, from the government to implement my, my idea more than actually get funding because, well, the, it has to come from the actual government. So in my way, in my, in my experience, I can do the, all the technical part but when it comes to the, you know, to all, to the, um, the relationships, the networking and all of that, it's been more difficult for me in the way that LA is spread out. LA is difficult to, to meet people personally. It's not like, I, I don't know, like London, New York, like it's, you have access to people like every minute. I mean, here is more like uh, all the networking is based on internet and right now with COVID it's more difficult and but my idea is mostly okay let's do meetups okay or be online but I'm not again I'm more like like I will say uh, my brain is more into the numbers the programming and what it helped me a lot is when traveling to France where I met this per uh, my uh, blind friend and I learned like, okay, this is a problem. There's a problem that I actually I didn't know. And now I know, so there must be a way to solve this problem. And um, being in LA, I couldn't see that happening just because I don't interact with blind people often, but I know they exist. It's just like, okay, I need to, I need to, uh, now that I'm back in LA, I'm interacting, like learning more about the people in LA, the blind people in LA, the visually impaired people in LA. So uh, it's been to me like very uh, important in terms of um, the, the entire diversity. It I actually come from Venezuela, as you said, and the diversity part of the whole um, environment is important in the way that in LA actually it's weird someone that come from LA is actually people from everywhere. And it's gonna, I think it's gonna, that's gonna help me a lot with, with my project. Thank you 
you very much uh, for sharing, Carlos. And I'm going to have some follow-up questions uh, uh, in the second round, and perhaps uh, after we can uh, tackle. I mean, it's very interesting that you were mentioning about the public sector um, as one of the gaps, brain, right? um, and to understand further if that's a matter of you know regulatory frameworks or it's just the environment, the enabling environment with. Uh, the network that you need to tap on. So, uh, but next we have uh, Zanaib. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing right, and if I'm not, go <laughs> correct me. Um, uh, can you also share us uh, with your creation, right, Tickmill? Um, what are the the? Uh, how do you think? What are the the, the this pressing challenges that you have as an innovator in your X system? Thank you very much, uh, Raquel. And yes, you pronounced my name right. It's Zenim. Uh, so I'll present a narrative of two worlds also. Uh, my innovation journey started from Pakistan. And if I say and talk about the region of America, I'm taking a transition as I moved here like eight months back. So I'm finding my way and navigating through here. Um, when I started my journey, I would say, uh, to be honest, that I didn't know what I was doing is called innovation. It started off from a very basic problem in the society that there are children and they are digitally isolated from the world and they do not have access to education. So I was started it uh, with that problem while I was a student in my university and I was I knew this is a problem in the world, in my country, in my society around me, and I have to, you know, fit in myself to solve this problem. So I started my journey from there. With time, I grew with my team. I had access to many communities, but the problem was that I was running on a system of uh, grants and funding and donations, right? So now the innovation was that I was creating a technology for the communities in rural areas where there's no access to technology. But at the same time, I had a product that could be offered to those children who are in established schools. The same product could be a revenue generation model. So there comes the innovation, a sustainability model. So my innovation journey, um, well, I would say that it's taking a transition, started from a nonprofit volunteer work, attempting to solve a very big problem of the world that is 258 million out of school children, no access to education, no access to digital literacy, but identifying what product could actually be a source of you know, sustainability for these children, connecting the children in the school, established school systems, and making their, them as a support for those that are not in school. So this is, I'm trying to connect I'm trying to refine my product. I'm trying to find the right connections. Uh, Valentina is here. She has been my mentor along this journey uh, in this boot camp. So these are the connections that matter. And these are the connections that I look forward to in the you know, upcoming time in, in refining my innovation journey. So the, this is the narrative of two worlds, Canada and Pakistan originally. Yeah. And that's perfect, Zanib. And I, I guess uh, with COVID, what we also learn is that the world is much more uh, less with borders. And uh, we are yes. uh, all <laughs> uh, children of uh, many worlds. Uh, together, we're humanity, right? So, uh, but thank you very much for sharing um, your uh, journey your, and your motivation. Um, I guess it's not also a surprise that we have um, the uh, uh, previous winners, now mentors, and 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 the current winners for the the the, the I two innovation uh, challenge awards, and so um, it's the network that needs to start building, and uh, it's also doing what you pitch for. <laughs> so um, anyway, so next and um, and uh, our last uh, speaker for this round is also Nelson Nelson Mila from uh, Honduras, who um, is the founder of Macau Tech, and it, it, uh, I guess. Uh, uh, Nelson, you've identified with Zenaib in terms of uh, the educational challenges that uh, you were trying to face, but uh, please tell us your journey and your motivation. How did you feel like being this innovator in the ecosystem uh, in our region? Hello, everyone. Uh, how are you? I hope you're doing great. Uh, I will talk in English, but please let me know if my English is a little on the rusty side to switch to Spanish. Uh, but okay, I think my journey is more of a multiple journey uh, in the sense that I have been uh, really active, not just like in the entrepreneurship myself, but helping entrepreneurs. 
uh, in that regard, I am a Startup Week in Progress facilitator. I organize events, so I have got to know a lot of the ecosystem of this new growing ecosystem. And well, uh, I have found uh, two big challenge that need to be addressed in order to start having all these uh, companies with really impact on society. I think uh, the first problem is uh, that Honduras as a country is really politicized. Yeah, it's really polarized. So uh, I have a talk with all these people and government uh, funding, for example, which is the largest funding pro program on the country becomes a liability. Yeah. So they become a hardship that means to the address instead of a help, you know, like they give you money, but they give you uh, tons of work that are not related to your company, right? More like paperwork, more like uh, come to this press conference because you win, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the other problem is actually uh, education. Like the numbers are like uh, 2000 people are currently signed on on a computer science degree out of 10 million people. So just to get a number, uh, access to education in general in Honduras is uh, really difficult. Like uh, five to 10% uh, of the people has access to public education systems at uh, the higher degree. Like the bachelor degree, it's only like five to 10% of the people that can access it uh, via that public system, right? Like the free system. So those are the challenges uh, that I have found in the ecosystem. And uh, that that is why my project is born, right? Like uh, trying to take people that has succeed not on an entrepreneurship level, but on a technical level, like people that are working outside of the country, under and people, that went to France, that are living in New York, that are work that are based in Honduras, but are working for, I don't know, an, an Amsterdam company, right? So taking all these success stories and putting in putting them out there, like, look, uh, these people, these people have succeed, has uh, found a better life in tech, and like kind of uh, teaching them the tech they do, but at the same time, like uh, giving them this uh, feeling of uh, achievement, like they can achieve this too, right? So that's a little bit about the environment here in Honduras. That's perfect, Nelson, and and thank you very much. I mean, it's the, the also the perfect link for my second round of questions, I guess, <laughs> um, that uh, you've already started and. Um, uh, which is about um, as an innovator, right? And then someone working in this environment to uh, boost other uh, innovators to uh, flourish. Uh, what do you see as the kind of, uh, perhaps it's not only one, but uh, trying to prioritize uh, what is the gap that is missing uh, to make this uh, digital ecosystem in, in Honduras? Uh, but also, um, um, if you can go more specifically, you started mentioning um, kind of where the public sector can be helpful or either this is more of the private sector. So what is missing and who uh, could take action for, for it? Okay, uh, so I think the key component that is missing is really on the vision side of things, right? Like the way we set goals in Latin America has been co uh, copy paste from Silicon Valley or Boulder, or Boulder, Colorado, sorry, that are the two major ecosystems in the United States, right? And all of these people have sold us their literature, their books, their media. And uh, this has been, I think, a problem uh, when we define a success in Latin America, people have this uh, mental image that uh, success looks like Facebook, that success looks like Google, like Airbnb. And yeah, it's, it's kind of success, 
but is it success in our context? Like, uh, I get the, the feeling that uh, this is a bigger problem in the ecosystem because uh, these big goals, this uh, unicorn mentality, like my company will be successful when it turns into a unicorn, it's what makes uh, the landscape very political, right? Like everyone wants to take a company and make it a unicorn and then say the Honduran government made this a unicorn. Or uh, there's a bank here that has a really good program, uh, but it has their li liabilities too, because they do, they, they too do this. Like they take these companies and uh, their end goal is uh, telling the world, we create Honduras unicorn here. It's what it was thanks to us, right? So uh, I think the first thing uh, to tackle is this mentality, right? Uh, because uh, this ends up uh, being a contest, right? Like, did the private sector make the first unicorn? Did the public sector make the first unicorn? Did, I, I don't know, right? Uh, did uh, this uh, incubator, this accelerator made, a, made an, un an unicorn or made a big company here? Like, uh, they are always in this fight, right? And this leads to a lot of uh, cannibalization on resources, right? Like uh, instead of uh, sharing and building together, they are taking what's uh, a speaker from the other. Like I remember, uh, sorry, I, this will be a short story. Uh, the government funding program had for their challenge winners uh, to get the money they had to sign an agreement where they ac accede to, uh, or they agreed to uh, be just a mentor for people on that program, right? Like they could not go, uh, I don't know, to community programs like Startup Weekend or uh, programs on the private sector. Not no, like if they want the money, they have to sign that they will only uh, be mentors for the government funded programs, right? And I think the other challenge that needs to be addressed is technology. That's why I'm addressing it right now. Uh, like tech education, right? Like uh, it's easier if you have uh, this mass of tech talent and you start teaching them like, hey, you can do your own company, you know? You can be, <laughs> right? Because uh, we have uh, this problem that uh, you cannot be competitive on the uh, world landscape if you are not technically able, right? So people on the outside are talking about uh, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, uh, cryptocurrencies, and you're stuck here uh, with a lot of engineers that know WordPress, you know? So how can we generate value out of these people that has this uh, outdated skill set, right? How do you generate value to the world? So I think that are uh, the top two problems that need to be uh, solved, at least on the Central American region. Fantastic, Nelson. And um, I guess it's very important where you bring um, at the beginning also in terms of uh, the, the culture for what success looks like and uh, how we need to take this uh, and, and, and develop this vision within the region. Um, if you were able to listen a little bit on the session, on the first session uh, for, for the regional forum, we had, uh, for example, Mercedes uh, Aramendia. Uh, she's the head of the, the telco regulator uh, for um, Uruguay, and uh, she mentioned uh, over and over um, how important it is as a government to be humble uh, and, uh, and understand that uh, this is a new field in terms of uh, how government operates and, and you need to listen in what are the, the, the ways to, to solve instead of uh, putting <laughs> top down uh, some of this um, 
this, uh, but of course, also there are different uh, countries within the region, um, and and uh, we all need to learn uh, from from each other. Um, but uh, thank you very much, Nelson. Um, and, and next we have uh, uh, Zenai, and uh, perhaps uh, as being you know working with two worlds, uh, <laughs> you can also uh, tell us a little bit more about um, what do you feel is missing, right? And and uh, where is this gap to uh, to really achieve the potential that uh, uh, innovators can can have. Um, I think I'll start with the quote. And uh, you see, some great scientist. I think I don't remember his name. He mentioned that carbon actually same form the same bonds to become a diamond or a graphite. And the difference is in the connections, the connections how they build and how those connections turn out to be beneficial. I find that the real gap is finding the right connections. Uh, the connections that actually work and turn out to be beneficial. Uh, for me, it was difficult finding the people who are aligned with my ideology, with my vision, and where I want to see the education and uh, how I want to see the technology transformation in education. Yes, when I find those people, I connect with them, and that's how things work. There are, there are chances of collaboration, partnerships, you are complementing each other's strengths and the weaknesses are, you know, complemented by each other, especially if I talk about developing countries, the culture of actually, you know, giving a nurturing environment to the entrepreneurs, giving them the right connections. This is the uh, platform where you should go and you will find the people who you want to connect with and they will share their experiences and they'll walk you through those paths they have walked. And that will be a lot, I think, easier to navigate your way. Now what's happening, I see that everyone, if, if, talk, if I talk about Pakistan, they're saying, okay, I, I want to be an innovator or I want to be an entrepreneur and I'm going to start. And all of them are starting from the same point. They have their own journey. They're falling, getting up, brushing their uh, and self up, then going ahead. But there's so many who walk through those paths, right? They don't have to do that again and again. How about if we connect them all? and connect them in true sense. And if they align and make those connections work. And I think this is the gap, uh, the real gap, the, which I would say these are the entrepreneurial supporting networks that should be strengthened in a way that can actually give benefit to the young entrepreneurs, especially those who are just starting and they have a lot to you know, tackle in, in their future. So I think this is the main gap for me, from my personal experience. That's perfect, Sanaib. And um, I guess next we have also Carlos, uh, who is uh, in joining, I think, uh, also many worlds <laughs> in terms of uh, the challenges for this network. And Carlos, for you, what is this big uh, uh, gap? What is missing to really achieve the potential? Well, as you mentioned, I'm from Venezuela. I had to leave the country because there's no support at all in my country, unfortunately. So you have to try new places. Uh, fortunately, I'm here in LA, which is now is trying to become the next Silicon Valley, even if it's not. But LA has been putting a lot of money. Uh, in fact, they put like a couple of billions, actually. And it's, it's growing, actually, very fast, uh, which, which is awesome. At the same time, uh, LA is being focused more on the Hollywood side, you know, like the, all the movies and but now it's investing in more and more. But at the same time, the talent is also usually coming from education from, you know, we have a lot of in, amazing university, universities. So they have UCLA, USC, Caltech, the Jet Propulsion Lab too. So they take people, they take those talent from them. What about, but what about the other people that is just, just came here? They don't know anyone. How can you help them? Like, how can you make them access all the resources? All the VC money is actually just distributed in. I don't. I don't feel like it's not distributed properly. There's a, a, about I don't know 90 uh, VC firms in in here and then in the LA County, and it, I believe it should be distribu distributed properly for people that actually are not that have not been here for um, a long time and didn't use the education that LA supports or the LA provides you. So in that case, to me, it's, in, it's been more difficult. It's same with the connectivity, same with the access to the public sector, which is, is tough, especially for my project, which is, is, is very important, having the public sector uh, input. 
So in that way, um, Los Angeles, even though it's it's fast growing startup ecosystem in the U.S., the fart the f is the fastest one. Um, it's still like having some gaps in in that regard. Um, the fact that being uh, not European, not American, not I mean, I'm um, being Latin is not a problem. I'm not saying that. It's just like uh, it's it, you need more connections in terms of maybe language barrier, maybe maybe the lack of of having a, a proper uh, education. Even though you're innovative, maybe you didn't have you know like you didn't go to a engineering school or to business school or whatever. Is 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 the fact that you have less opportunities and I'm talking about and I get I'm pretty sure it gets worse if you're a woman which is is it's really sad so uh, in that case I will I will love if those things will change here thanks a lot Carlos and I guess uh, tapping all the inequalities right for inclusion it's uh, it's pretty much important and you've connected uh, to, uh, I'm calling next uh, Sean, and I think uh, Sean connected uh, to some of those challenges in terms of uh, the not being prepared right, for your education in terms of to, to be an innovator and, and, and what it takes to, to, to hold your own uh, company. Uh, but Sean, uh, so uh, apart from this, uh, what else do you think is missing in terms to, uh, to, to help boost this innovation? Well, so I will actually touch on what Zaib and Nelson shared a, a little bit, and I would identify the human connection. I think the human connection in the whole process of, of building ecosystems, part of it is missing. It's more transactional based than relationship building. And so, for instance, when you have these different ecosystem um, innovation challenges, et cetera, a lot of time, it's really looking at how can you screen out ideas as quickly as possible, rather than understand who the innovators are, what problems that they're solving, and really trying to see how you can support that innovator. Um, I also look at in terms of the silos. So because of how the silos are built, uh, constructed, you don't, as I say, you don't have coordination of the system. And so you really need to connect innovators to each other and really get people to understand what are the opportunities that are available, how can you collaborate and build partnerships with others in order to then get your product or your service to your customers. Without, without that and without existing, uh, being able to tap into existing systems, it's very difficult for an entrepreneur to actually create all of these systems and then get your product to market. So I think that quality of relationship and then tapping into those existing networks and partnerships are key and it's what I believe is missing. Perfect, Sean. Human connections. Either you were face-to-face, uh, -face, preferably, or online. <laughs> it's all important <laughs> to keep that in mind. But thank you very much. Um, and at last uh, for this round, we have uh, Valentina. Valentina, you've been uh, working now uh, for a while with this um, innovators uh, ecosystem. And so uh, what do you feel is the, the, the priorities missing uh, to really boost the ecosystem? Uh, on my perspective, I will have to agree with, with what Carlos mentioned and also Nelson. For me, it's education, maybe in, in different levels. I think that from my experience as I work with the government, what I see is that we lack of a common vision or a shared vision as all the different institutions kind of work separately. So on one side, you have institutions like they were, uh, the one that I work in, that is supporting innovation and new ways of doing things. For example, I don't know, uh, electromobility. And then we have another institution that, uh, either, for example, the, the Minister of, of Energy or Transport that is forbidden uh, electromobility in a way. So that kind of disconnection between uh, institutions that work for the same government, it's, it's just weird. It's like you are really not talking to each other. So. Well, this is kind of my ideal that we have this common vision of the country that we want to, be, to build, or even for the region, 
And somehow I think that will help to all these different organizations to know where, they, where we are going, where we are heading. And maybe you will have find different ways of achieving that, but you are going for the same shared vision and, and goal. So I think in, in the way of the education, I also feel that as this is not a contribution or project, this is a still a very close environment for many people. And there is a lot of people out there like that it's not really connected with all these technology and digital businesses and blockchain and all these words that we like are familiar with. So I think this is a way of um, putting closer this, this world of innovation and technology, entrepreneurship to the people that don't, today are not really having access to any of that because they are struggling with other things in their lives. And this is very far away from them. So I think that education in the very first levels in terms of technology, for example, will help us also to build a stronger ecosystem as we will have people with the right skills and abilities in order to actually work in startups or in innovation in companies, for example. And on the other side, it's something like I mentioned at the beginning, uh, education in terms of the people that is already in the ecosystem and then maybe our young entrepreneurs, that this is a learning process. This is not something that you will come up with an idea and you will succeed uh, one year later, maybe. This is gonna take a few fails first. You have to keep learning and you are still learning when you are um, developing your project. And something that came to my attention is that when I talked to one of these guys, he said, maybe even the twenties is not the best uh, age to start a business because you don't really have experience in how to run a business. So maybe you should actually start working for some uh, company in order to understand how this is, how this works. And because you may have all the technical abilities, but this is also has something that has to be sustainable in time and, and be able to like survive and, and get income. So they're still running on time. So maybe the, the best way is to get a little bit of experience in how is a comp what is an enterprise, what is a business, how to run it, and get some uh, commercial skills, networking skills, and then you are gonna have a, like a better foundation to, to start a, a startup or to run a business. So I would say that I will I I, I would say that the gap that could actually somehow uh, make this environment better would be to have this kind of ambition and to have education at the, at the different levels. So as this is, all, is something that is already happening, I would say that we have to actually look at the young uh, generations because otherwise they are gonna be grown up later and they are gonna be completely lost in, in this new world. And, and maybe without the skills they will need to have in order to succeed or to have an opportunity out there. That's uh, very wise words, Valentina, <laughs> and also in terms of, um, uh, I think it's the paradox for um, our generation and also the, the information society uh, that we are in, um, in terms of uh, we do have a lot of information, um, probably much more than the previous generations, but uh, uh, not necessarily you have the knowledge behind it because you need to um, uh, how you digest, how you appropriate from this information. And uh, that's all about the education, the culture and the environment you were in, um, uh, you were growing in. Um, and I guess in a very uh, quick exercise, if you think about even in the past five years, uh, what came in terms of technologies is uh, um, some uh, are really surprises and, and uh, surprising examples uh, that uh, we were not prepared to even being more of the digital natives. <laughs> but anyway, but thank you very much uh, for um, for all, everyone uh, for for uh, sharing uh, some of your perspectives. I know we have just half an hour um, and uh, we still don't have uh, any questions coming in. So let me uh, tap into uh, one more round um, uh, among us. And I'm going to start uh, perhaps with Zanaib. Uh, Zanaib, if, if, um, you've mentioned your uh, in your experience, right? Um, um, that um, your journey came from this um, 
uh, spark where you wanted to have uh, uh, all kids um, to give access to kids, all kids uh, to to education, right? Uh, but um, apart from, I mean, your your journey itself, uh, how do you see? What do you see are the problems you are trying to solve um, in the world, but also uh, in terms of the the, the innovation? Yeah, I think uh, I'll, I'll try to, you know, do justice with this question. <laughs> um, you know, it's ironic. We are trying to get our foot on Mars, star civilization there and everything. But at the same time, there are like 258 million children across the globe with no education, access and digital literacy. If I put it into words, like uh, it's like three to four times the uh, total population of New York. Uh, and uh, imagine if, if all of this population had never access to education. Imagine for yourself for a moment that if there was just a time traveler and he could have one superpower to erase one day from your life. And that is the day that someone held your hand and took you to school, erased. That didn't happen, right? If that didn't happen, where you would be at the moment, at this very moment. So for me, my inspiration did come from a very young boy who actually flew from Afghanistan everything ended for him. All I could give him was some education and he got through you know, that difficult time. And then I looked around in my country that there are 22.8 million children with no access to education. Where do I start from? It's a big thing and maybe I wouldn't, wouldn't be even a drop in the ocean if I start my journey. But I did start from 45 children, reached out to 1500 out of school children. And now I'm saying that there are children all across the globe in Africa, in the you know the refugee camps the children in the war they need a solution that is suited for them um, yesterday i was hearing the talk of nasir he was saying that creativity is in the captivity we know there is captivity we know there are limitations we know there is no internet over there we know there are no schools we know there are no teachers over there we, we know there is no infrastructure over there let's build something that caters to all of these needs there are multiple age groups i'm talking about the education level of primary basic level like starting to learn from the very first step so now you have to offer something that is completely out of the box keeping in mind all of these limitations. So where there is no electricity, use the renewable energy sources. There are portable solar generators. Where you think their online system doesn't work, shift into, into offline systems. Where you think that you cannot progress track it, the technology to automate it and progress track through machine learning and artificial intelligence. Where you think the teachers cannot be trained, give them all the content that is available. There's so much content available, why we are not making use of it, why we are not generating the impact. So my innovation is connecting all of those dots, making a model that works for them in their communities. And I am open to you know giving suggestions to all of those people who are struggling to give education to their children that let's build something that suits your environment and that catered to the needs of your children. Because there is an Elon Musk out there in these children. There is a Steve Jobs there. There's another Bill Gates there. There are so many other Nelson Mandela there. These are the children that needs to be given this opportunity. I didn't choose where I was born. Is it their responsibility where they were born? No. It wasn't their choice. No one wants to be born in a war zone. No one wants to be born in a place where there is no school, no electricity or nothing. So if this is the problem, you have to find an innovation that suits to their need. And I have a stories. I mean, out of 1500, I have so many stories that gives me motivation on every single day. Like Maria is like 12 years old and she doesn't have, she was very young when she lost her mother. And she started her journey one year back. And so she is a digitally isolated in a village, a very small village. It is a, in, in the area of Thar Cholisan, it's a desert place, right? And uh, it never rains there. When it rains, there's flooding. That's the situation there. And in this one year, she learned basic literacy and numeracy and all of that. And she set up one, you know, a little bit of shop in her own village. And she started her own entrepreneurship journey in her own village. So that's the opportunity that we need to give them. And that's the problem that I'm going to solve. And I will solve it wherever I can get the right connections. And this is one of the forums. So that's it from my side, I think. 
Fantastic, Sanaib. And I, 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 I do hope you can find all the connections that you need because this is not only such important, I don't want to be lame, like <laughs> this is so important and so, so amazing, but, but it is, right? And uh, you were showing a very realistic way that um, to change the world, you need to go one step at a time, just do what you can uh, right here, right now, and then build that up and replicate and find the other hands and voices that you can bring along together. So uh, congratulations. It's very, very inspiring. I'm, I, I hope there are many uh, hearing this uh, right now or just later and and, and can join and, and support uh, your project, it's, it's really amazing. Um, and then also, Carlos, I guess uh, I'm going to call you next in terms of um, uh, what is this uh, problem? You started mentioning uh, your journey uh, with your friend and, and uh, when you get closer to um, people with disabilities and, and, and how to bring them in. Uh, but would you like to tell us more about uh, what is this problem that you were trying to solve and how innovation is bringing that in? Uh, well, yeah, I have an inspiration. It's my friend, Venezuelan friend. Uh, she lives in Paris and I, I was there. I was, oh, let's, let's hang out. You know, I haven't seen you in, in a while. So um, I realized how difficult for her was, you know, to navigate the outside world. I was like, imagine you like even us like non-disabled people you get lost you can get lost easily even with your google maps imagine if you're visual impaired it, it gets even worse and i started asking her like hey how do you do this and how do you do this and then she told me she tells me stories where she have to reach out people she have to she relies on help from other people just to navigate because uh, every time she goes to a new place it's, it's, a, it's a problem and yeah, they have other options, other apps, but they rely on a satellite, on a satellite. And you have, you know, buildings that block, can block your signal and it becomes a problem. And then you, you waste time, you probably feel insecure. You are, I mean, it's, it creates a lot of, uh, I will say like a stress on them. And it's not only her, of course, she told me another stories and it's a whole community. We're talking about millions of people that are having the same issue and we all know about this it's just like the problem that we have the the solutions that we have right now are not very specific for this so in my case it's a whole system where is of course in a it's, it's a it's an app as well but it relies on loudspeakers where it tells you like feed accurate and where's your position especially nowadays that with COVID that uh, they cannot reach out to other people for help because you have to maintain the social distancing rules, of course. But in this case, if there's something new, like in Paris, for example, they have to access some hand sanitizer booth that they, they, are, they have to go there after they, they go to the subway. But she doesn't know because it's something new that they change every day. But with this technology, you can actually access those specific spots uh, uh, all in real time, of course, and very accurate. Something that, you know, Google Maps is not going to be able to do. Like, even bus stops, like, something easy, like, you should do, uh, you should be able to do is, like, it's not possible. They, you don't have, a, uh, you know there's a bus station there, but you don't know exactly where it is. You have to rely on someone else. And that's, that's a lot of stress. I mean, you don't want to do that. And at the same time, the visually impaired, peop uh, visually impaired people, the community is part of the economy. They can bring a lot of, uh, uh, you know, work and new ideas and they can be part of the, uh, the economy, the community, the, the entire system. But these limitations are, are, are there and, you know, I'm trying to help that and make it, make it work. That's another amazing, inspirational uh, work, Carlos, and, and thank you very much for sharing. I guess, uh, <laughs> same as Zanaib, I hope that many are hearing and, and uh, you can get more support uh, over, I guess, uh, even uh, to connect in LA uh, with more people and more letting um, and, and others uh, <laughs> who are interested. Um, and next, um, uh, we do have one comment. Um, I, I just want to point out, um, um, I'm not sure you can all see the Q&A, 
but um, um, it's a common from Facundo Monti. Um, and he's saying that the main problem is that universities don't teach about how to, to entrepreneur for decades. And I guess um, you've all tapped that <laughs> in, in different levels. So that's a good one. Uh, and that brings me to Valentina then. Uh, Valentina also brought that up uh, pre, um, uh, um, in, in, in your journey. Um, and Valentina, for you, what is this uh, problem you were trying to solve? Where does your inspiration come from? All right, <laughs> this is a tough one because I think that we try somehow to cover, as a program, we try to cover so many gaps. But uh, at the beginning, so what we first tried to, to solve, it was what I mentioned at the beginning, like try to change the mindset and get people inspired into the digital business technology and, and so on. But on the side of the, of the startups and the entrepreneurs themselves, I think that we are trying to give them support, somehow educate and, and, uh, and give them access to these different subjects that we think that will help them to achieve their goals. And all, not, all, not, not necessarily for the startup itself, but in life, like they, they, they have access to this knowledge that maybe in another country they wouldn't have access. So we try to add value in that way. We also try to uh, build a strong network for them so the, we are able to open doors that it will be extremely difficult for them to open themselves just knocking doors. So we try to get these very strategic alliance in order to be able to offer them and get them connected with big companies and big stakeholders in the ecosystem. You know, somehow make it a little bit easier for them to get into the different markets here in Chile and abroad in the region. And also, we also give them funding in order for them to validate, prototype, and hopefully become a successful startup. So I would say that we somehow try to cover different subjects, different gaps that we have right now in the country. And that's our little grain of sand that we can, that we can make. But on the side of, of the projects that I have the chance to support uh, in, as, a, as a key account manager, uh, I would say that the big category that they, they try to work in is sustainability. I have a lot of agrotech agro projects that try somehow to improve the way that we are producing this, uh, the, the food and, 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 and these agro products that today we have a lot of issues with pesticides and um, the, the supply and everything. So there are different solutions trying to improve that, make it more efficient and more sustainable in time. And also uh, some of the startups are trying to create plant-based food and even uh, creating the, the, the algorithm uh, on how to build this and open it up for everybody that really actually wants to make a change in, in the food te uh, tech industry. And and also, also education, we have a lot of startups that are trying to find a way of improve education or make it more uh, interesting for kids today as they already have somehow access to technology, the whole educational system is somehow outdated. So they're also uh, trying to make uh, an impact and a difference there. That's perfect, Valentina. And uh, you do have this umbrella where you are the bridge, right? The bridge between all those gaps. Exactly. We, as we don't have like in a specific industry, we really have to go one by one and see what gaps can we cover. So yeah, no, that's a that's real good. challenge. That's a real challenge, but that's a, a a good one, right? And also, I think it's amazing to work with these different uh, markets or industry shares where uh, sometimes you do have this all uh, digitalized and, and, and ready to go, but sometimes it's more of a traditional market where you are bringing them in uh, full force and, and, and introducing to a new, um, not only way of working, but a new society. So that's amazing. Um, I, I can feel the inspiration there. <laughs> so um, next we have also Nelson. Nelson, uh, I, 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 I'm sorry, I just saw you cutting a little bit. I hope it's not my connection dropping. We still have <laughs> some time to go. But uh, Nelson, 
Now, I, I wanted also to hear from you. Um, I mean, in terms of uh, your inspiration and uh, what is the problem that you were trying to solve um, in not only in Honduras, I guess you've mentioned that uh, in the beginning, but uh, what is there, you know, tickling for you? <laughs> Okay, okay. Uh, I think this is a tough, a tough one for me too. Uh, I don't think I have a, a emotional story like Sainia and Carlos. Uh, I think uh, mine is a little more on the pragmatic side of things. Uh, uh, well, uh, my story is like this. I used to attend and to mentor and to organize a lot of uh, entrepreneur events. Uh, I used to mentor like the state program I did once. I participated in the private sector events uh, and organized some more grassroots events, right? And uh, on all of these events, we have a, a constant, right? So these people came in and they were different people that didn't knew each other. And uh, I mean, on separate events, right? And they always came up with the same three uh, startups, right? So they, they there were always like the tourism map, always. There's always a tourism map on, on these hackathons, on these boot camps, on these state programs. There's always uh, the transportation app, like uh, you need to catch a bus, you can go catch a bus on my app, right? Like the bus is going to be here at this time. Uh, there's always, uh, and, and you get the point, right? Like uh, these people are always coming up with the same ideas and they never succeed. That, that begs the question, why, right? It's because, uh, well, at least what we found out is that these people really what they are lacking is uh, the knowledge to do something different, right? So when you put them to the exercise and you, okay, uh, no, this is entrepreneurship, this is a startup, no, make your own startup. They will come and they will use what they know, right? Like uh, basic web programming tools and they will tell you here, there you have it. Uh, I will have a tourism app that people can come online to uh, www.honduras.com and they will see uh, uh, the places they can visit, right? Because that's what uh, their uh, technology knowledge uh, leads them to, right? So uh, I think uh, one of, of the other problems is uh, the, the people that have the technical knowledge uh, go out from Honduras, right? Like, why, why will you stay here with all of the social problems, with the money devaluation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that I'm sure uh, people in Venezuela and Argentina can relate to. Uh, maybe Honduras is, is uh, really on the same track. Uh, maybe people don't know because it's uh, smaller than those countries. But uh, why, why will you stay here when there is opportunity for you to work on a company, on a big company in the United States, right? So uh, we took all these uh, people and tried to reconnect them with the Honduras ecosystem. Like uh, come here, well, not only the Honduras ecosystem, it's really open for all uh, Spanish speakers. Uh, that, that's our only rule, you have to, uh, speak in Spanish like, to give uh, your workshop because uh, language barriers, right? It wouldn't serve a purpose uh, to talk in English. But yeah, uh, so uh, that that's our, our main goal, like uh, having these people take the technical abilities that lead them to a good job on the outside and pass on that knowledge to young students, right? So on the next hackathon we go to, on the next bootcamp uh, we make, uh, you will come to these people and ask them to make their own startup. And they will start thinking about, uh, yeah, we are going to do uh, business, uh, big data analysis uh, as an outsider, right? 
we are going to take uh we're going to make an iot device for this and that yeah so it's not just uh the basic the basic uh info website but it's uh something that people can actually find value in that's that's from my side and that's very good Nelson. Uh, you have lied there it's not a <laughs> you have a good story you're thinking about emotional but pragmatic is also about changing the lives and uh, what you were trying to change right and so uh this is very very good <laughs> thank you uh for sharing um and uh, i'm i'm so sorry i'm, I'm going to rush um uh, just uh, we have just 10 minutes uh, to end uh, i don't see any uh oh just as I said, there is one more question. Uh, but before that, I'm not missing Sean <laughs> to share his inspiration. And uh, Sean, what are you trying to to uh, to change? What is your uh, problem that you're trying to solve? Okay. So my startup, of course, or, or the name of my startup is Ipsum Technologies. And we got started seven years ago when I met my friend Marlon, who is totally blind. So. I'm working on a problem very similar to Carlos in that we will actually identify the issue of navigation. Um, in colloquial terms, one of my, my co-founders said, um, I can't see past my nose. I need something that can help me navigate. And so we actually collaborated and we developed a prototype, which we called the Movie Assist. And so we were able to build an application similar to Carlos again, where, but in this case, what we did is we actually utilized something called ultrasonic sensors to navigate, uh, to be able to detect obstacles within a physical indoor type environment, and then process that information and then provide instructions. So what our device would have said was left clear, right block, right clear, left block. And we could have calibrated it to do a lot more than that, but we wanted to keep the instructions very simple based on the feedback that we had from the community. So that would have gotten me, I would say started, but what I had some difficulties with is when you're trying to build an electronic device, you have to go through um, FCC certification, you have to test things in laboratories, and that's a very expensive process. And so I realized that I I could not continue on that path. It's a, it's a, it's a need that, that is certainly not met in the current um, circumstances, but based upon the challenges with raising finance and being able to show uh, an economic return on investment to, you know, in, to venture capitalists, it was a very difficult sell. So eventually, I. I, I assess what the problem that we were trying to solve, which is how can we help persons with disabilities, those who are blind, those who are deaf, those who may have some form of physical impairment. And so we pivoted and we looked at how can we do digital accessibility, right? Where we could identify mobile applications, web applications, identify what are some of those challenges that persons may, with disabilities face in being able to access information, education, job opportunities, and be to help to develop, work along with companies essentially to help to develop accessible websites and mobile applications. And so I've been doing that for the last two years, more or less refining the model to, to a point where I know that it works and I can work along with businesses to help them develop their web presence or their mobile applications in such a way that not only would they meet their target audience, but they also are building it so that it includes everyone. Um, what I've also been doing is working with the community of persons with disabilities. So there are various assistive technologies that they utilize like screen readers, um, screen magnifiers, if you're, you have low vision, as well as you have um, uh, mobile, there's certain types of chairs um, that allow for you to be able to move around fairly quickly with, um, that uh, actually have their applications built into them. So it's not a standard wheelchair, you actually can use the wheelchair together with your app and you can help to, you can actually use that to, to be mobile. 
Um, and I've also been looking at various types of assistive technologies to person, help persons who are deaf. So for example, you have live captioning, you have um, text, live transcription, etc. closed captioning. There are various things that people use. How can we understand what is available and then make the volume of content that we have produced on, our, uh, on the web accessible to persons who may not be able to see it or to hear it. And so that's what I've been working on. But as I said, it's not a straight journey. You have to sometimes pivot and understand where the market opportunities are, what are some of the barriers that you face, and then figure out a way forward. So that, that in a sense, um, helped me, at least through experimentation, observation, and working and getting that type of feedback, be able to chart a new course. But it certainly, as with, with the problem Carlos is working on, I can definitely chat with him a little bit more um, because I think that it's something that we could potentially collaborate on. Okay, and you can uh, literally see me cheering now that it, we found a connection in the panel and I do hope yes. we have much more uh, going on. It, it's, it, it's incredible and that's the idea of sharing, right? Uh, you can... Um, you know, you not only you share the problem and the problem, as you said, Sean, are moving targets. So the problem also changes and you need new solutions to, to tackle them. And uh, I guess like Valentina was saying, uh, sometimes you do need uh, this bridge octopus uh, mode to <laughs> address all the multiple gaps that are coming in front of you. So uh, that, that's amazing. I guess we have uh, four minutes left. We do have one question uh, that came in uh, um, uh, from Facundo Mondi. Um, he's asking about uh, what, uh, I guess it's an open question for the panel, in terms of the neoliberal, neoliberal policies and technology, like in Argentina, um, that they had four years of pseudo-technical revolution, but it was funding should speculation. And I guess we are going to see much more of that uh, going on with COVID. Um, we, we can avoid <laughs> to mention that COVID uh, has accelerated this digital um, uptake, but at the same time, uh, we do have the fandom of the bubble and, and, and all those things, financial bubble um, coming in. Uh, so with four minutes left, I'm not, uh, unless anyone wants to tap this uh, particular question, uh, I'm going to ask you guys for a tweet like uh, 140 uh, old tweet like <laughs> um, mention uh, to close the panel. Um, you can either keep to a tweet or to a one word that would uh, really emphasize uh, how do you see innovation and uh, in, in the digital ecosystem, how to unlock the digital ecosystem in the region. Um, here we go. I'm going to follow the, the initial order. Valentina, you go first. <laughs> I would say it will be about uh, shared vision and education, period. Perfect. Um, Sean. So I'm going to share my tagline for my company, which is digital inclusion for a better world. We need more inclusion. Perfect. Uh, Carlos. To me, it's just one word. Actually, it's just empathy. That's what we need. Nothing else. Perfect. <laughs> uh, Zanip. I think as we emphasized on connections, so the right connections, uh, that would be the concluding remarks from my side. Great, and uh, last but not least, Nelson. Okay, uh, I think I would uh, like to share with everyone that uh, success can look different than having a unicorn company. Changing the life of people, it's success too. So you don't have to be making billions out of it if it makes a difference in your country, if it makes difference for people you care about, it's enough. There are more billions than only money, but that's a perfect closure. And uh, thank you so much everyone uh, for uh, first sharing your story and taking the time. Um, I think the time really flies when we are uh, talking about our inspirations and, 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 and what you guys are doing. Uh, before we close in this one minute, I also want to thank everyone uh, involved in the organization of this panel. Most of them are behind. Uh, probably we, we, we cannot see, but uh, the interpreters, um, ITU staff, 
um, ITU Americas um, and everyone that's been there. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it has been great and I hope you can enjoy. There is one more day for the, the Global Innovation Forum and tomorrow we're going to see the award ceremony, right? Uh, I guess uh, you, you have some, uh, some, uh, some more to, to, uh, to participate. Uh, thank you very much and have a great uh, well day, afternoon and, and uh, see you on the net.